And we are recording. All right. Well, welcome to this Bible study. This is our last Bible study on biblical theology, which is really a standalone lesson. What I wanted to do was give you an overview of the whole Bible in one sitting. And it might even be less than an hour, less than the 53 minutes that we have left. It's going to be highly visual, though. So um, if you guys would have a screen, I'm going to show a lot of slides here. But if you're just listening, you could also watch later as it is going to be recorded. All right. So let me... Um, let me share my screen. Here we are. All right. You guys see that? You guys see the keynote here? Okay. So this is what uh, a lesson we did. I did for um, for some other brothers uh, from another church, or actually a group of churches in the Philippines, but I thought we should do this with our church family. So here this is. All right. Um, so the, the, the theology of the Bible, if you're going to get a biblical theology, a big picture of the whole Bible, you actually have to know the parts of the Bible. So you need to know the story first. All right. So there are three big parts to the story of the Bible. Um, there's the Old Testament and then there's the New Testament. So that's two parts, but there's three parts within the story of the Bible. So you have the Old Testament history. So you have the history of God's people in the Old Testament. This goes from Adam um, all the way to the very end of the Old Testament with Malachi, at least chronologically, okay? So you have the Old Testament. Now, part two is not the New Testament yet. You have the prophetic view of the future. So while the Old Testament is going on, at some point in the middle of the Old Testament, um, at some point in the middle of the Old Testament, John, can you admit the person in the waiting room? Um, yeah, my mouse is not showing up. John, are you there? I admitted him. It's just stuck on joining. So, all right. Does that mean yeah, I have to proceed? I got can this. You, can you see it on my screen though? I can't see it on your screen. Oh, it's showing up on my screen. It's not, it's not moving. <laughs> well, I pressed admit and he's on joining right now. So. Is going Unless we're like doing some double authentication business, I'm pretty sure he's fine. Yeah, I just need to get off my screen. Okay, I got off my screen. Okay, good. Okay, so um, there's the prophetic view of the future. So sometime in the middle of the Old Testament, God starts sending prophets to prophesy about a future. And that's a second part. It's kind of overlapping with the history of the Old Testament. Okay, so those are the two things from the Old Testament. And then you have, lastly, you have the New Testament. So Jesus fulfilling the whole Old Testament in the new. That would be, um, whoops. Yeah. So that's those are the three parts of the Bible. Old Testament and then um, prophetic fulfillment of the of, of prophetic vision of the future and then the New Testament. Okay. Let's go to an outline of the bit. Actually, before I go there, let me do this with you guys. How would you guys summarize the story of the Bible? Um, not actually, not, not summarized. Let me do it this way. Um, how would you, how would you, um, let's just go through the events of the Bible. So it starts with creation. What happens after creation? Let's fill it in. Creation and then? Fall. Fall. Okay, and then? Mm, covenant. Covenant with or through? Abraham. Okay, coming in with Abraham. Noah first, and then Abraham. But yeah, Abraham. Okay, yeah. That's a, Abraham's a big one, though. Abraham, and then next major event in the Bible story. Uh, Exodus. Okay, the Exodus redemption. Man, you guys are gonna make EJ do all the work, which is fine. I guess he, he's doing a great job. So, Thanks, and they're probably all on mute. So, okay, after the <laughs> Exodus, EJ or anybody else, they're all on mute. EJ, they're not even they're not even unmuting themselves. They're just relying on you right now. Yeah um i always get kind of fuzzy here but uh i would say like uh in the world they're in, in the wilderness but yeah. that's not really they, they enter into the uh israelic covenant in the wilderness yeah and then after that well, we talked mm -hmm. about last sunday but you were out of town after after moses is the what judges kings i don't know anybody else can you guys help ej out Conquest of Canaan. Conquest of Canaan. That's right, Caroline. Conquest of Canaan. After that is what? 
Period of the Judges. Period of the Judges. After that is... Saul David Solomon. Yeah, yeah. Saul David Kings. Solomon, and that's what my dad said. Kings. So you have the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, and then after the United Kingdom, you have the the exile. Okay, no. Before the exile, so it's it's United divided. divided Kingdom. That's right. You have the divided, divided. kingdom. Oh, yeah. After the divided kingdom, then you have the exile. Then after the exile, the Old Testament ends with what? No. Are they still in exile? The year of silence, no. Are they still in exile by the end of the Old Testament? Yes. Yes. You have the return to the land? Under yes, you have the return to the land. That's right. So with Ezra and Nehemiah, they return to the land. Remember Ezra, they rebuild the, um, Ezra reestablishes the law covenant. Nehemiah rebuilds Nehemiah the wall. Rebuild the wall. Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple. And that's how the Old Testament ends. Okay, and then the New Testament, you have Jesus. After Jesus lives, dies, rises again, and ascends to heaven. After Jesus ascends, what happens next? You have the what? The, the church. The church. Yeah, you have the church. John preached on Acts 1-8. You have the church. And then at the very end, you have what? The new heavens and the earth. The new heavens and new earth are the consummation. Okay, yeah, that's the, you guys got it. So that's the Bible story. So with that being said, let's go back here to the, um, <clears throat> To this part okay i think i'll keep it here because i i could actually see my mouse this is probably better for me okay can you guys see this okay or is it is it too small do you want me no, to make it bigger DJ, we can only see the top bar on your slideshow and not any of the actual slide whatever now you can see it yeah okay when it does this though i can't see my mouse okay anyways we'll just do it that way all right um so here you have an outline of biblical history so you guys got it. So creation, fall, and then um, EJ was right. Abraham. Then you have. So this middle line is kind of if they're right, if they're in the right place with God. But they move out to Egypt, Exodus. So they're out there, and then they come back to the land. And then David is the king at around 1000 BC. And then under Solomon, you have the division um, of Judah and Israel. Israel is eventually exiled in 722 BC, uh, about 150 years later. Babylon is, um, um, the Ju uh, Jerusalem is destroyed and Judah's exiled. Then they return from the exile into the land and they're back in the land with Ezra and Nehemiah and they're there until 400 BC. That's the end of the Old Testament. Then you have a little 400 year break. That's the dots. And then you have the New Testament with Jesus, the church and the consummation. That's the story of the Bible. Are you guys tracking? You guys okay with that? Ready to move on? Any questions? All right. So now let's go to theology because biblical theology is based off of the history. You have to know the story before you can start to really um, pull out and, and understand the theology of it, at least in the bigger picture, putting, connecting all the dots. So let's start to do that now. So remember, we talked about three stages, right? Old Testament history and then uh, prophetic future and then Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament. So here, let's do a theology of biblical history. You have creation through the fall, then Genesis 4 through 11, that's Cain killing Abel, Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babylon. Then the Abrahamic covenant, where God promises a nation, a land, and a blessing to the nations. That's what he promises Abraham. Then Isaac is born. Jacob has 12 sons, become the 12 tribes of Israel. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. They're in Egypt because of Joseph going there first, well, to save them, really. And they're in captivity. They're not in, if, the, if God promised them a land, but they're not in the land, they need to be freed from slavery in Egypt to come back to the land. That's the Exodus redemption. Then they enter into the Israelic law covenant at Sinai. And then they enter the promised land. That's what we talked about last Sunday morning in our, in our gathering. Then they possess, and there's a tribal territories, again, talked about on Sunday. Then you have the period of the judges. And then the period of the kingship, United Kingdom, and then uh, the Jerusalem temple is, uh, the temple's built in Jerusalem. Then you have the divided kingdom, the, uh, the schism or the schism, schism. And then you have the decline. You have the destruction and exile. Okay, so this is the history. And then they return reconstruction, but it's disappointing. At the end of the Old Testament, they're disappointed when they're back in the land. The temple is dinky. 
It's not impressive. People are still rebelling against God. That's the, <laughs> at the end of the history. Okay, so that's that first black line. Okay, that's this black line here, Old Testament. <laughs> now let's do the red line here of the prophetic future. Actually, wait, one more thing here. So the kingdom of God is revealed from Genesis 1-1 to 1 Kings 10. It goes from, um, you see God as a creator. They have a Davidic king. They have a promised land. So 1 Kings 10 is Solomon right before he fails. So it, it, yeah, God created the world. He created them. He redeems his people out of Egypt. He gives them the promised land. They're in covenant with him. They have a temple. They have a Davidic king. They have peace everywhere. And so you have the kingdom of God as God's people in God's place under God's rule. That's what it was in the Garden of Eden. And that's what it is now in the land of Israel under Solomon, the king. You even have the nations coming in to be blessed by Solomon as they learn from Solomon wisdom. And Solomon says, hey, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of Yahweh. That's the beginning of wisdom. And so he's sharing the, the message of Yahweh um, completely, I mean, regularly as, as the nations are, are streaming into him. All right. Any questions here on how it's God's people eventually in God's place, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, under God's rule with the temple and the Davidic king? Any questions here on the, the theology of this history? Okay, no, no questions here. Let's move on then to, um, to think about how this points forward. So this is Graham Goldsworthy's notes, by the way, these slides and his teaching. You can find it in the book, According to Plan, um, The Gospel and Kingdom, or it's called Gospel and Kingdom. According to Plan would probably be his best book, though. And he also has a book called Christ-Centered Biblical Theology. I'm going to show you um, some things from there at the end. So the kingdom of God is revealed in Genesis 1 to 1 Kings 10 as a pattern of the real thing. It foreshadowed the reality that was yet to come. But then the whole structure started to unravel because they divided, right? They, they, they were... Uh, Israel was rebellious. They divided as a kingdom. They were idolatrous in the, in the north and they were exiled. They were idolatrous in the south and they were exiled after hundreds of years. So even though this looks like the kingdom is coming, it's actually getting ruined again. And then they're exiled, which is almost like the Garden of Eden. They're kicked out of God's land. So what does prophecy do as Israel is failing and then they're kicked out and then they're brought back? So here, this is stage two. So during stage one, um, you have the kingdom going up to Solomon, really, in terms of the history being revealed in its ideal. Then in stage two, the kingdom of God and salvation is revealed in prophetic eschatology. Just like God said, I'm going to bring you back to the Garden of Eden, almost in Israel during, during Solomon's time. Now, God is going to prophesy that same kingdom in prophetic eschatology, the end times. In the end, God will bring the kingdom better than the Garden of Eden, better than the time of Solomon. All right, so now it's time for the prophets to do their ministry while Israel's declining and being exiled. So here's a list of the prophets and when they prophesy, just to give you an idea, you have Elijah and Elisha. Well, so you have the, in, the, in black, you have the non-writing prophets. Well, actually, that's not true because you have Moses there, but you have Abraham, Moses, Samuel, Nathan, Gad, Elijah, and Elisha. Then during the exile, you have Elijah and Elisha in the north, but then you have the writing prophets. The purple is the minor prophets, Hosea and Amos in Israel, Joel, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah uh, in Judah. Then you have Isaiah there. And this is in sort of chronological, uh, th this is chronological order of the prophets. Then you have Isaiah prophesying, Jeremiah, who are the major prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel are prophesying in exile. And then Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi when they're back in the land. The only reason we say major and minor prophets is not because one is necessarily more important. It's just they wrote more. It's bigger book prophets and smaller book prophets. All right, so these are the prophets during the exile, and they're going to say a lot of things. There's a lot of your Bible, and this is actually part of, probably the hardest part of the Bible to understand and read. I'm doing my devotions right now in Isaiah. Um, even as I raise my kids to read the Bible, I tell them when they get to the prophets, I kind of give them the, give them the big picture. And then I just say, yeah, you guys could read through it, should read through it. But I think the more you know the Bible story, the more it will make sense as you get older. But these are the hardest parts of the Bible to read, I think, and hardest to teach, actually, to teach it well, which is why I want to give you this big structure. Any questions on God's prophets in the Old Testament from any of you guys? 
questions from y'all. No questions? All right, we're gonna move on then. So from there, we have here, um, sorry, hold on. Let me minimize this for now. Okay, so now you have the message of the prophets. What did they say? The writing prophets speak against the background of Israel's covenant breaking, and they all have they all say the same three things in different ways. Accusation, you sinned. Um, judgment is coming. God is going to judge you because of your sin. There's punishment, and then there's reassurance of hope. God will redeem you in the end. God will establish His people, and uh, and there will be restoration. Okay. So accusation, judgment, and reassurance. All the prophets are saying these three things. Any questions on that from you guys? Is anyone right now um, currently doing their uh, devotions in the, old, in, in the prophets? Anyone doing their Bible reading in the prophets in this season of their life? Just me? All right. Um, so from here, that, that's their message though. Here's your sin. Here's what God's going to do because they're going to call people to repent, but you're sinning. They get convicted. God is going to judge your sin, but God will restore his people and his promises have not failed. That's the end of that. Okay. So from here, this prophetic eschatology. So the kingdom in biblical prophecy is from first Kings 11 to Malachi. If you're, if you're just looking at your English Bible, Genesis to first Kings 10, 1 Kings 11 to Malachi is, a, is stage two, the kingdom of God and salvation revealed in prophetic promises of future restoration. So you put it together in stage one, the kingdom of God and salvation, after they fall out of Eden, God's people in God's place under God's rule, God will bring his people back to his place under his rule, mainly, finally, from Abraham all the way, finally, to David and Solomon. And then here in the prophecy, they're pro prophesying the same restoration. So I want you to see this. This is, the, this is the theology now in history um, that God created the world. God made a covenant with Abraham and then a covenant with Israel as his, his covenant people in, with the Israelic covenant through Moses. They're captives in Egypt, but then they're, they're redeemed out of Egypt through the Exodus. God promises that they will possess a land. They will have a king who will reign. They'll be in Jerusalem or Zion, Zion and then they'll have a temple. So this is the theology of the Old Testament in history. God's people in God's place. So God's covenant people through the Israelic covenant, redeemed out of Egypt, in God's place, the possession of the land under God's rule, the king and the, the Israelic covenant. Now, in the prophets, when you're reading Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, all the writing prophets, they prophesy the same things to be renewed. So if you have the creation in the Old Testament uh, with Genesis, there's a promise of a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. You have the Israelic covenant through Moses. You're promised a new Israelic covenant in Jeremiah 31 and a lot of other places. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. They're captives in Egypt and they're going to be redeemed out of Egypt. Many times the prophets say, no longer will you say the God who redeemed you out of Egypt. You're going to say the God who brought you back from exile. So just like they're redeemed out of Egypt, now they're going to be redeemed out of the exile. Then they're going to be brought back to the land because remember they're exiled. God promised they would be brought back to God's land that a new David would come up. You see that in Jeremiah 23, the whole chapter, Ezekiel 34 as well. It talks about the, the new Davidic king, even Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. That's going to be one of our Christmas passages this year. And then there's promised a new Jerusalem and a new temple. Ezekiel, the very end of the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48, is all about this new temple which Sam, our brother Sam, read for us this Sunday from Revelation 21, which is tied to the Ezekiel 40 to 48 temple. So you see here that what God did from Genesis, from Abraham to Solomon in history, God is, as they're declining and exiled out of the land, God is promising that he's going to do it again. A new creation, new covenant, new, new, new Exodus redemption, new land, new Davidic king, new Jerusalem, new temple. So the future kingdom of prophecy has the same structure as the past kingdom of history, but it is different in that it will be perfect, glorious, and eternal. The first one wasn't perfect, glorious, and eternal. Solomon was an idolater. 
and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. It wasn't eternal, it failed, and it wasn't perfectly glorious um, in a glorified sense because there was still death. So that's the end of the Old Testament. All right. Any questions on the Old Testament from you guys? That's an overview of the Old Testament in about 25 minutes or 22 minutes. Does that make sense, EJ? Are you tracking along? Mom, dad, any questions? Caroline, Bethany, Crystal, Reese, or John? It's okay if you don't have any, but I want to put it all together in one shot, the Old Testament. Kingdom in history, kingdom in prophetic eschatology. All right, no questions, no comments. All right, let's move on then. Let's go to the New Testament then. How does this go in the New Testament? It's very important that you get this because um, we're going to pull it together here. And to do that, um, it's necessary to really grasp the Old Testament. So here in the New Testament, you have stage three. So three stages to the whole Bible. The revelation of God's kingdom, which is God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Now it's revealed and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It was revealed and prophesied in the prophets. Now Jesus is revealing it fully and he's fulfilling it in himself. All right. So remember in stage two, you had the new creation, the new covenant, the new captivity, the new possession of the land, new divinity king, new Jerusalem, new temple. Now Jesus is the new creation. The Bible begins with, begins with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Isaiah says there will be a new heavens and new earth. Jesus comes as the new creation. Actually, all things, it says in Colossians 1, uh, I think verse 19, that all things in the universe, have, things in heaven and on earth, is, rec is reconciled in Christ. Jesus is the sphere in which the new creation exists. Okay? Uh, Jesus is the one who fulfills the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. You guys are familiar with that, with that statement from Jesus. So um, the new covenant is fulfilled in Christ. Hebrews 8 talks about that. In the new captivity, um, God redeemed them out of the old captivity, uh, old captivity through the Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb. And through him, the new exodus and the new redemption will come. That was prophesied. In the, in the prophets, they prophesied a new possession of the land. Well, Jesus is where God and man dwell. Like I said, the new creation exists in him. Uh, Jesus is the new Davidic king. It says in Matthew 1, verse 1 and verse 17, Jesus is the son of David, son of Abraham. He fulfills the Davidic promises of Jeremiah 23 and, and Ezekiel 34 and Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Uh, Jesus, the new Jerusalem and the new temple is where God dwells with his people. Well, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the new temple. He says, destroy this body and in three days I'll raise it from the dead. So Jesus is the new temple. So all of that, the Old Testament history was showing in history from Abraham to Solomon. All of that is reprojected in the prophets in a better way. And Jesus comes and fulfills all of it. All, all of those prophecies are fulfilled in Christ. So you guys can see it here from um, history, the type or the first set of the pattern, the confirmation of that pattern and the projection of that pattern to the future. And then Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills that pattern. Now, um, Graham Goldsworthy will call these types. Typology is a technical theological term. Um, I'm not sure if uh, he calls this macro, like big typology. I'm not sure if that's the right terminology for it, but um, it certainly is a pattern that you see in the Bible that really just helps you get the whole Bible in, in a clear shot. Old Testament history, prophecy, Jesus, fulfilling all this, all of the kingdom of God, God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. So you have here the stages again. You see it in Israel first ending up with Solomon over God's people with the Israelite covenant in Jerusalem with the temple. And then as they split, as they decline, as the prophets are prophesying, as they are exiled from the land, as they come back to the land, the prophets are saying the day will come when God's kingdom arrives. And then Jesus comes and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he comes to bring in the kingdom and fulfill all the promises of the prophets and all that, all the patterns 
of the history. All right. Um, any questions so far from you guys? Questions from you guys? Is that confusing? EJ, you're tracking. Mom, dad, is this confusing? Or are you guys tracking? Does it make sense to you? Yeah. I think you're on mute, but I think you're saying it makes sense. I can't hear you guys. Does it make sense, mom? Yeah, yeah. we're following you, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so when you're reading your Bible, I want you to see how, this is how you could know how everything points to Christ. One of the members asked me on Sunday night, hey, um, does every verse have to do with Jesus? Um, and I, I said, well, not necessarily directly every verse, but every verse is part of a passage, which is part of a book, which is part of the whole story, which connects and points to Jesus as a fulfillment. So every verse in the Bible is related to Jesus and connected to Jesus, but not in a direct, specific way for every single verse. Okay. But to know that you need to know this structure or not, you don't need to know this structure, but this structure helps you know how to, how to see and make those connections. All right. Well, let me move on here um, as we continue through. So let me put your faces back up here so I can see you guys while I'm teaching. Okay. So here, um, here's how it, it all shakes out in, again, maybe in a little bit more detail. Creation to new creation to Jesus is the new creation. Covenant with Abraham and really covenant with Israel to the new covenant, to new covenant in Jesus's blood. Captivity and exodus, redemption from Egypt, new captivity and new exodus, redemption from exile. Jesus is the Passover lamb and the new exodus. You can read uh, Luke 9, 31, I think, talks about Jesus and Moses at the transfiguration, talking about the exodus that he's going to perform. One of the Sunday night sermons is going to be on that in December. So you might hear about it then. Um, tabernacle and temple as God's dwelling place was in Jerusalem. Uh, David got Jerusalem and then Solomon set up the temple in Jerusalem. Well, the new temple is the dwelling place of God prophesied in the prophets. Jesus is where God and humanity dwell. He's the word uh, made flesh, the word that tabernacles with us. In With Solomon, they possess the land through Joshua. Well, there's a possession of the new land prophesied and Jesus fulfills the land as the dwelling place of God. David was king and he got the new Davi the Davidic king uh, covenant. There's a new Davidic king prophesied, and Jesus is the new David. Then there's Jerusalem and the temple, the new Jerusalem and new temple prophesied, and Jesus is the new temple, the new Jerusalem. All right. So there it is again, another way of thinking about it. This is from Graham Goldsworthy's book, Christ-Centered Biblical Theology. So you have here a shadow and reality if we're talking about type. Another way you could talk about the Old Testament is the Old Testament, God promises, promises made, and then the New Testament is promises kept or promises fulfilled. God promises through history and through prophecy that he's going to bring his kingdom, his people in his place under his rule and blessing. And that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He fulfills all of the Old Testament in himself. Okay? So here's the three, um, the threefold structure you actually see it building from creation and Abraham to David. That's structure one. In structure two, on the second box in the prophets, you see the, da the dashed line going back down. It mm -hmm. actually goes back down because of the decline and splitting to the exile. But meanwhile, while it's going down there on that first box, on the box on top, the prophecy is going higher. It's actually, it's actually prophesying a greater thing than what they experienced with David and Solomon. So the prophecy is getting better while the nation's actually getting worse at the same time. And then when Jesus comes, he takes those promises and he fulfills it in ways that are far more glorious and far more beautiful and far more majestic and magnificent than we would have realized even from reading the prophets themselves. Christ comes and takes it and he fulfills it in himself 
and um, and for um, in, into the new creation. Okay. Let me just say now this is my last slide, but let me let me say um, or actually let me pause here to see if you guys have any questions. Any questions from you guys? PJ, or, can you or, or thoughts? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, um, it's hard for me to follow it. Say that again, Crystal. It's hard for you to follow. This image here. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a cursor. Can you guys see my cursor on here? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the first box is from Abraham to David. Okay, box number one, that's phase one which is the kingdom in history, the kingdom revealed in Old Testament history. You can see that there on the, mm -hmm. on the, on the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, it's getting better with Abraham. He doesn't have a land. He's promised a land. He doesn't have a nation. They don't have a, 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 a national covenant by the end of David's life and Solomon's life. They're in the land. They have an Israelic covenant. They have the temple and they are God's people. And the nations are streaming in to, to get Solomon's wisdom. So that's, that's the high point of Israel's history. You tracking so far? Yes. Okay. Then when the kingdom splits and they decline, that's that dash line on 2A going downward because the history is getting worse. That The high point in their history is Solomon, but then it gets worse after that, all the way until they're finally exiled in Babylon out of the land. So the dash there of 2A is saying, historically, things are getting worse. Meanwhile, the box two, not 2A, but box two, while from Solomon on, the prophecy is that God's people and God's place under God's rule, this kingdom is going to be even greater than what Solomon and David experienced and what Israel experienced. So it's moving up in terms of escalation of greatness. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then on, the, on box three, Jesus is taking those promises. He's fulfilling it in his life. If you think that maybe at the bottom of box three, he's fulfilling it in his life, death, and resurrection. And then kind of as you move through box three, the church is in there. And then by the end of it, Christ comes again. At the very end of box three, Christ comes again, and that's the consummation. So the promises, I mean, the history and then the promises and then Christ fulfilling it. It's just the, 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 the story of the Bible, it just gets better and better and better until Christ fulfills it. And the new heavens, the new earth is the greatest fulfillment of everything. So there's escalation. Got it. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, EJ. So this all makes sense to me. Um, I think what's confusing about the uh, image is, um, so the box to the right of number two yeah. and below number three, um, I don't understand like, like this, like, I, I think I understand like this, like that it's increasing, but I just don't understand. Like, is that, is that box just like a placeholder? Like, I don't get I think it. So. Yeah. The two yeah. under three. Yeah. Like, so, so all, all those boxes below number three. Um, yeah. I'm just like, yeah. and, and I guess even to a degree, the one under number two is just like confusing. I'm just like, what am I looking at here? Yeah. The one under two is again, just the history of what's happening oh, in the old. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because if you if you want it, and so yeah, if you just think of the the light gray and then goes darker gray and then black, right? Mm -hmm. So like it's increasing and like like God's short sort of showing His kingdom, yeah. And it's getting clearer, and then boom, in Jesus, it's so I think what that's showing is the clarity. It's getting clearer and it's escalating. It's getting greater. Okay, great. That's what that's showing. Cool. But I mean, because yeah, historically it would be more confusing. But where two A drops at the bottom there, at the bottom with Jesus. You can mm -hmm. almost just draw it from that line from Jesus all the way to the top. <laughs> you know, if you wanted to do that, that would be another way of looking at it. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Other questions or comments on this? All right. Well, I'm going to show you now. Well, not from here. I'm just going to tell you now. How does this apply to us today? Okay, because if all of this is fulfilled in Jesus, if all of this is fulfilled in Christ, how does this apply to us Christians today? The answer is um, everything is fulfilled in Jesus. I, I, okay, so everything is fulfilled in Jesus. Um, and everything we do in our Christian lives right now is only done in Jesus. So don't think Jesus, in one sense, it's Jesus and then the church, but really it's Jesus 
The whole thing is Jesus, and the church is united to Jesus. So everything in the Old Testament is in Jesus. From Matthew all the way to Revelation, all of that is in Christ. So if you want to understand the New Testament and how that works theologically, you can think of it in three ways. It's Jesus for us, Jesus in us, and then Jesus in all creation. That's, that's, that's how the story of the New Testament moves. Jesus for us, Jesus in us, and Jesus in all creation. So Jesus for us is what he does, life, death, and resurrection. Before any of us who are on this Zoom call was born, Christ was doing things for us. He fulfilled the law for us. He was, he was baptized in the baptism of repentance for us. He resisted Satan for us. He taught for us. He fulfilled the law for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead for us, apart from us. Just he did it for us, but we, have, we had nothing to do with that. He did that for us. And so this is a little bit why, I mean, as Protestants, this is why we, we say we're saved not by our works, but by Christ, because he did it for you. You didn't do it. He did it, okay? Amen. So he did it for us. And, and so we're saved by grace through faith in what he did for us. But then when you trust in him, so then we preach the gospel to each other, right? We preach the gospel to non-Christians. Christ died for you. He rose for you. Repent from your sins and trust in him. When they trust in Jesus, they are united to Jesus by that faith. And once you unite to Christ, who's the new creation, just like a leper who touches Jesus, Jesus doesn't become unclean. That person becomes clean. When I, I trusted in Christ in 1989, as soon as I trusted in Jesus, I was connected to him. And anyone who is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. creation. By virtue of me touching Jesus and connecting with him by faith and repentance, I have become a new creation. And so when you look at BBC and you look at the 108 members gathered on Sunday, you have a new temple because they're all new creations and they are a new temple together. Not because Jesus left and now they're the, like, they're, they're the next temple after Jesus. They're only the temple because they are the expression of Jesus. They are the body of Jesus, the body of Christ. So, so what you see in the church, when I look at EJ's face right now and my mom and dad with a live feed and I look at John's picture and I see a bunch of other people's names, what I, when I see Christians, I'm seeing people who are the new creation connected to Jesus. So what Christ did for us, he now does in us by the spirit applying the redemption to us. So as we gospelize each other, if EJ is helping me work through a sin of my life or I'm helping him work through a sin in his life, all we're doing is we are drawing out what Christ is already doing in what, what Christ already did for EJ or for me. Now I'm helping EJ experience it in his life. And he's helping me experience it in my life. <clears throat> so everything we do, all of our church ministry, all of our edification is not doing something for people. Christ did it for us. We just want to work out our salvation. So Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God working in you both to do and to will for his good pleasure. So Christ did it for us. He's working it in us. And so as we work on each other, as we gospelize, edify, rebuke, discipline, disciple, even as we gospelize non-Christians, we're trying to get them connected to Christ because there are Christians, like, let's just say, I, I'm just going to keep on saying EJ because he's the only one I could see here with my mom and dad. If EJ wasn't a Christian right now, but EJ was going to be a, become a Christian today, Christ already died for EJ, right? It was done in history. Mm -hmm. EJ is not saved yet right now. He's going to be later tonight, but Christ already did it for EJ. He died for EJ. He rose for EJ. EJ's salvation is guaranteed, even though right now in real time, November 3, 2020, EJ is not saved right now in his experience. But as I gospelize EJ today, and as he hears the gospel, and as faith comes by hearing, Christ, what Christ did for EJ now becomes Christ in EJ because EJ is in Christ in his conversion. So even now, as you're doing ministry, as you share the gospel with your non-Christian friends, those who Christ died for, whom Christ died for, they, he already died for them. They're going to be saved. It's, up to, it's, it's on us as a church to, to gospelize our neighbors and to be a, a shining light and to love them with the love of Christ and to speak the gospel so that faith comes by hearing because it will be applied to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's all of, so when you're reading the, the, the letters, so you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's Christ for us right? And then you see it working on history and acts. When you read the letters of Paul and the, the, the general letters all the way to Revelation, 
what you're seeing Paul do and the, the apostles, what they're doing is they're applying what Christ has done for us to Christ in us. And they're calling you to that. When they're looking at, when they're writing to the Corinthians about the man sleeping with his dad's wife, or they're believing heresy, or they need to discipline somebody out of their church, or um, they need to raise up pastors or elders and deacons, or, you know, biblical manhood, womanhood, all that stuff. All of that is just applying what Christ is for us to Christ in us in Bellflower, Southeast Los Angeles in 2020. That's what our ministry is. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, that's all of life from Christ's ascension all the way until Christ returns. And when Christ returns, it's not just Christ for us and Christ in us. We are the new creation now, but this building is not new creation. There's ter- termites here. Things are, things are falling apart, right? This is not a new earth, but when Christ returns, we are the new creation right now. So when you come to BBC this Sunday, you look around at the members, you're seeing new creation in old bodies, old decaying bodies, but you're seeing new creation in their faces. And then when Christ returns, all things will be made new. And everything, I'll just read the verse since I keep referring to it. Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, 19. It says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ, and through Christ to reconcile everything to himself whether things on heaven or things in whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So, well, this is not quite what I'm saying. Let me just say what this is saying. Then I'll read another verse. What this is saying is God is reconciling everything to himself because the creation is not reconciled to God because of our sin. It's a broken, fallen world. It will be reconciled, but it's reconciled through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So it's through Jesus, but it's also in Jesus. I think Ephesians 1.11 gets at this better Ephesians 1 11 or 1 10 it says um well begin in verse 9 God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ so God's purpose is in Christ as a plan for the right right time to bring everything to bring everything together in Christ both things in heaven and things on earth in him. So all of the new creation is brought together and to exist in Christ. That's God's big plan. That was made in history and prophesied among the prophets and fulfilled in Christ in a Jewish man's life, death, and resurrection. You're like, big deal. A Jewish man is hanging on a cross. Big deal. A Jewish man rose from the dead. No. When we say happy Lord's Day and we're talking about the resurrection of Christ, what we're saying is when he rose from the dead with that resurrection body, all of the new creation was accomplished and exists in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's what we celebrate every Sunday, not just his resurrection, but our resurrection and the future resurrection or future renewal to come because all of that is in Christ. All right. So to put it together, um, and then we look at the chat because maybe there's a question here in the chat. Oh, wait, sorry. That was about a box a long time ago. Yeah. Shadow to reality. You're right, Reese. That's what it is. So yeah, so to put it together, I want you guys to get the big story of the Bible. Kingdom in God, the kingdom is God's people in God's place under his rule and blessing, right? Mm-hmm. It's revealed in the Garden of Eden, but it's ruined in the fall. Then through Abraham, the promised blessing is going to come and eventually it gets to Solomon and David, that high point, Solomon and David, where it's God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing in Israel. But then from that high point, it declines with the exile and... Um, and the prophets are prophesying a greater kingdom, but it's still not looking that way. It's actually looking worse. Then when Christ comes, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, that all the promises are going to be fulfilled. And so, but people don't believe him, so they crucify him. And what Christ does, he does for us. Then he works it in us, in history, in, our, in the church history, and then he fulfills it finally and fully in the new creation to come all right so god's kingdom for us in us and then in all creation okay so that's a summary of the bible Um, any questions or comments on how to understand how the bible fits together theologically in christ or thoughts ej any thoughts oh sorry go ahead who's that 
Bethany. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's kind of a specific question, but I was reading the Jesus Storybook Bible last night, yep. and it was Pentecost, and basically she was saying like when they got the Holy Spirit, like that's yeah. when they got new hearts. So I'm wondering like when was the new covenant? Did it happen when Jesus resurrected from the dead? And then was it different when the Spirit came or? Yeah. At what point did the new covenant start? Uh, yeah. Great question. The answer is yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, so the new covenant actually comes because that's a similar question, Bethany, to say, when does the kingdom of God come? When does the kingdom of Christ come? Does mm -hmm. it come in Christ coming? So let me answer the kingdom one. Then I'll answer your thing about the new covenant. Like when did the kingdom of Christ come? Well, it sort of came when Jesus came in a sense. But then in a greater sense, it came when he rose from the dead. But it's even a greater sense still that it's all over the world right now. Um, his sinner saving curse reversing rule is actually in a, in a greater sense even now because the temple is not just Jesus who's walking around, but the temple is EJ and you and uh, my mom and dad. And so like now the temple is spread all over the world in people. The Holy Spirit lives in them. And then the kingdom is going to come when Christ returns. So is the kingdom mm -hmm. here or is it coming? Yes. In, 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 in increasing sense. So to your question, Bethany, uh, when did the new covenant, um, when was the new covenant inaugurated or ratified? I would say it probably started when Christ rose from the dead. That's when he accomplished it for us, but it's being applied to us. Christ for us is now Christ in us. It, be, it started to become Christ in us uh, definitively in, at Pentecost. Okay. Yeah. So new covenant for us accomplished in his resurrection new covenant applied to us or in us at Pentecost and from Pentecost on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. EJ. So um, in the Christ as Passover lamb, that was in parallel with um, uh, Exodus captivity and Exodus. Right. And so can you actually just uh, flesh out or clarify? I don't know if you already did, but it kind of went over my head how Jesus is the Passover lamb matches with, captivity in exodus okay so yeah no that, that's a great question um so with captivity they're in egypt and pharaoh will not let them go after nine plagues he still won't let them go so what's the 10th plague that actually gets them out of captivity it's killing the firstborn sons right and so but so what does god do for israel he tells them to kill a passover lamb in the place of the firstborn son shed put that blood on the doorposts right so that God will pass over them. And in that Passover, through the Passover lamb that's sacrificed for the household and for the firstborn of the household, God redeems them out of Egypt. So, mm -hmm. so the Passover lamb is part of the key, the Passover act and that 10th plague is what redeems them out of Egypt through substitution and judgment. Mm -hmm. And so then it's prophesied and Isaiah 53 would kind of be the Passover thing in prophetic eschatology where, where Isaiah prophesies that someone's going to die for their sins. And then Jesus comes and he says, um, the Lord's Supper is during Passover. It's actually a Passover meal. That Thursday night, they're taking the Passover meal. And he says, he takes the cup, which is celebrating the, you know, they're celebrating the Passover lamb during the Lord's Supper. Yeah, and he's yeah. saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Yeah. So he's actually taking the Passover and just saying, hey, all of that was pointing to what I'm about to do tonight and tomorrow when I die on the cross. Got it. Cool. Thank you. And that, and that redeems us out of our slavery to sin and hell. Got it. Yeah. Other questions, comments, or thoughts? Anything in the chat? All right. Well, it looks like you guys are all tapped out. That's uh, biblical theology in a summary. What this does, this is not the only way of putting the Bible together. This is just one of the ways of doing it. But what it does is it gives you a backbone so that whenever you're doing your devotions, wherever you are in the Bible, like I'm in Isaiah right now, I could I know where Isaiah fits in the storyline. And I know how I know that it was a prophetic or history before that. It's in prophetic eschatology. Jesus is coming to fulfill Isaiah. So I, I could know that when I'm reading my Bible. What's that, Dad? No, Isaiah is... Uh... The story of the whole uh, Bible. Story of the whole Bible. Yeah, it does because it's pulling from the history with the Exodus and their their failure, mm -hmm. and it's prophesying the future, and then the fulfillment is in Jesus. 
Yeah. 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 Isaiah is great. And so you'll notice, even as I'm preaching Joshua, as I preached Joshua yesterday mm -hmm. or on Sunday, and I'm going to be preaching judges this Sunday, Lord willing. Um, mm -hmm. As I was preaching Joshua, when I'm applying it and saying, conquer the land, I'm not saying go kill people and genocide, you know, like that's not the new covenant application, but it is Christ for us. He's our captain who's conquering the land. He's going to conquer these people in the sense that they're going to repent from their sins and trust in Jesus. But we're called to follow him and to go share the gospel and disciple people because that is our conquest right now as we share the gospel, as God's working it in us. So I'm getting that application and I'm applying it to our church and I'm saying it's a biblical application because of the biblical theology of the structure of the Bible. When you're reading Joshua for your devotions, you're not going to get that when you're reading the allotment of the land or conquering the land. You're just going to think, why would God do that? Which is a great question to ask. I mean, it's a relevant question to ask. But what, what this what biblical theology does is it helps you properly apply the Bible to yourself through Jesus. And it helps you take the whole story into account as you're reading the Bible. Yep. All right. Well, I hope that's encouraging to you. This is recorded if you need to review it because it's a lot. Um, if you guys want the keynote or the little PowerPoint slides, I'm happy to send you a PDF of it if that would be helpful to you. I could actually send you also the Graham Goldsworthy lecture where a lot of this is from. Um, it's in his books, but I'll send you guys the YouTube link as well um, in case that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. I see someone requesting a PDF. I will send that to you as well. Okay. Let's pray. Father, help us to understand the Bible. Help us to understand Jesus. Help us to worship Jesus and understand how the Bible actually points to him. Father, this is a big overview of the Bible. We pray that um, as this can be misunderstood or misapplied, or even as there could be error in the actual way that the structure is articulated, give us discernment. Help us to keep going back to your Bible, not to be uh, merely filled with knowledge and arrogance of being nitpicky and correct, but help us to know your Bible better, that we might grow in humility, that we might grow in loving you, loving Christ, loving the Holy Spirit, and loving our neighbors in the power of the Holy Spirit. So grow us in knowledge for the sake of love, we pray. Thank you for this time. Help us to read our Bibles this week. And we pray for our brothers and sisters from our church and elsewhere and other friends who might be watching this video later. We pray, Lord, that this would help them to understand um, the Bible and how to um, put it all together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Have Thank a good uh, Tuesday. And I'll see you guys later. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.